Hello to everyone and a hearty welcome to this webinar. Jesuits and the Ignatian family all over the world are celebrating the Ignatian year from May 20, 2021 to July 31, 2022. This webinar is an occasion for each one of you to join the Society of Jesus and all who follow the ways of Ignatian spirituality in celebrating the Ignatian year. The purpose of Ignatian year is twofold. First, commemoration of the 500th anniversary of St. Ignatius Loyola's injury during the Battle of Pampalona, which ultimately led to his conversion from soldier to saint. Second, it is to mark the 400th anniversary of the canonization of St. Ignatius and St. Francis Xavier on March 12, 2022. The topic of today's webinar, Ignatius and Xavier, Conversion and Spiritual Friendship, is a help for us to understand the legacy of Ignatius and Xavier, especially as we are about to celebrate the feast of St. Francis Xavier on December 3rd. Dear friends, let us begin this webinar by invoking God's blessings upon each one of us. Let us prayerfully listen to the prayer which was very dear to St. Ignatius, prayer for generosity. Lord, teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve you as you deserve, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and to not to ask for reward, save that of knowing that I do your holy will. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, Father John Pradeep S.J. is the coordinator for the Ignatian Year Committee. He is the novice master and holds a master's in Ignatian spirituality. He has been actively promoting Ignatian spirituality this year through various activities. May I now invite Father John Prithi to welcome the participants and introduce today's speaker on behalf of our provincial, Father Dionysius Vaz. Over to you, Father John Prithi. Thank you, Father Prashant, for your welcome. On the 15th of March, dear 1540, dear friends, St. Francis Xavier left Rome for India at the behest of then Pope, his bosom friend, St. Ignatius of Loyola. This evening, let us return to Rome to listen to Father Rolfi Pinto, one of the erudite scholars on Ignatian spirituality today. Dr. Father Rolfi Pinto S.J. hails from Karnataka, India. He belongs to Gujarat province of the Society of Jesus. He has a licentiate in dogmatic theology from Pontifical Gregorian University, Rome. And he has done doctorate in spiritual theology from Pontifical Gregorian University, Rome. His doctoral research was on the letters of St. Francis Xavier. Since the year 2013, Father Rolfi is teaching spiritual theology in the Institute of Spirituality, mostly Ignatian spirituality, at Gregorian University. His interests are giving retreats and a spiritual accompaniment. On behalf of other Dionysius was the provincial of Karnataka Jesuit province, 
and the members of the Ignatian Year Committee of Karnataka Province and all the participants of this webinar, I extend a cordial welcome to Father Alfie Pinto and thank you, Father Alfie, for your gracious presence with us this evening. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Father John. Thank you also, Father Prashant, for considering me and inviting me to address this webinar. Very happy to be here and also welcome to all of you. Uh, I begin my presentation. Let me share my screen. Ignatius of Loyola and Francis Xavier, Conversion and Spiritual Friendship. Let's begin with the, with the last uh, thing in the life of uh, Francis Xavier. The picture that you see, couldn't get a better picture of Sunshine Island off the coast of uh, China. Soon we'll be celebrating the feast of uh, Francis Xavier, 3rd of December. And on the morning of 3rd of December, Francis Xavier was breathing his last and entrusting his spirit to God with the holy name of Jesus on his lips. And while he was uh, on, his, on his chest, uh, what we found, uh, what they found was this, not this casket, but something similar uh, with, the, with the signature of uh, Ignatius and his companions. And it also had the formula of his profession and a relic of uh, St. Thomas. Uh, that is what was most dear to him and what he was, he was carrying around his, around his neck. Here you have another uh, picture, very, very moving. This is um, outside the rooms of uh, the present rooms of Ignatius in Rome. This a sort of antechamber to welcome the guests to the rooms. And uh, you have some scenes of the life of Francis Xavier. This is one of those uh, where Francis Xavier is dying and uh, is moving because he's been there for three months wanting to enter China so close, yet he is not able to enter. So he's, he's uh, contemplating the blue mountains of China without um, being able to enter China. You have some more pictures which are um, different representations. These are um, <clears throat> more what you call hagiographical, uh, more with the, with the air of sanctity, uh, different representations of Francis Xavier breathing his last on the 3rd of December. Uh, what we are celebrating also next year is 400 years of uh, canonization of both Francis Xavier and Ignatius of Loyola. Ignatius was beatified on the 27th of July, 1609, by Paul V. And the same Pope also, 10 years later, beatified Francis Xavier. Uh, and then comes the canonization. The picture that you see there is Pope Paul V, uh, who is holding the decree of the canonization of both the saints. And that day also were canonized uh, three others, Philip Neri, uh, Isidro Labrador, and Teresa Vavila. There were four of them were Spaniards, and uh, one was Italian, Philip Neri. So the Romans uh, jokingly were saying, Pope is canonizing one saint and four Spaniards. And that was 1622, uh, March 12th. So next year would be the 400th anniversary. So it's a fitting uh, occasion to speak about the, uh, the friendship between Ignatius and Francis Xavier. So with that word of introduction, I just give the outline of what I'm going to speak today. Uh, first off, of conversion, then of friendship, and then uh, going a little deeper into the authenticity of, uh, of friendship and what that could mean for us today. The background you see is the castle, a beautiful castle of, uh, of uh, Javier or Xavier. So we go to understand the, the conversion of Francis Xavier. I think we need to go a little backwards, first to the, the Battle of uh, Pamplona, in which 
uh, Ignatius of Loyola fell wounded, and this year is the 500th anniversary, 1521. And Ignatius at this point is 30 years of age, and Francis would be 15. He would have been in this castle. Um, in the in the picture, you see the church in that. Um, that would have been the place where Francis Xavier was, was born. Now, Francis's brothers, Miguel and Juan, fought on the side of the French uh, against Castile or Spain, whose army Ignatius was leading. We know well that Ignatius was leading barely about 1,000 men maximum against an army that was 10 times bigger, that of French. And at that time, the the brothers of uh, Xavier, they were the allies of the French. So we realize here that Francis Xavier and Ignatius belong to rival families. And in this picture that you see there, uh, uh, there were eight men that um, brought uh, Ignatius. The French themselves decided to send Ignatius back to the castle. Uh, there were about eight men bringing them, taking turns. It took about 16 days uh, to bring uh, Ignatius from Pamplona to, uh, to Loyola. Among those, among the men who carried Ignatius back, there is also a cousin of, uh, of Ignatius, uh, sorry, a cousin of Francis Xavier. Uh, but all this uh, would, be, would be remembered later at this point Ignatius would have no idea that one day he would be meeting uh, Xavier in Paris. Because of the disobedience of, um, of the Xavier family, the then regent of Spain, uh, Cisneros, Cardinal Cisneros, he punished the, uh, the Xavier family by bringing down the towers of the, the towers that you see in the picture. Uh, they, are, they are rebuilt, but they were raised to the ground because of their, uh, their uh, rivalry. And those days, you know, no tower means no power. So the Xavier family was reduced almost to, to misery. And his two brothers had to flee and hide. And they were given uh, amnesty, general amnesty, a uh, uh, forgiveness. Uh, and then the brothers could come back to the castle. Uh, Xavier's father was, was already dead. By the time his brothers returned to the castle, it is, uh, Xavier is already 18. Uh, and then um, when they come back to the, to the castle, uh, the, the crown of Castile had removed all the privileges of the Xavier castle. So they had no source of income um, because they were granting some of the privileges like taxes on grazing grounds and things like that. Now with no source of income, the brothers of Xavier decide that now only option left for them is this uh, Xavier by sending him to Paris to the, to the best place for formation. Uh, it was the most well-known place. And then if he went there and um, acquired a doctorate, then he could come back to Pamplona and become a bishop. And that would almost be guaranteed. That was the purpose with which they were sending Xavier so that he can come back with a degree and eventually go on to become a bishop. And that would again, bring back the fortunes uh, of the castle of Xavier. In 1525, the, in autumn, uh, Xavier arrives in, in Paris to begin his philosophy course. So he had his uh, primary uh, education in the castle itself, which meant learning Latin. So he would have had enough knowledge of Latin before he went to, went to Paris. And three years later, Ignatius will arrive in, in Paris also to begin his, his studies. In 1529, after the first year Ignatius lived elsewhere, uh, again, he was taking a course of Latin. And 1529, he would move 
to the, the college of Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara College, where um, Francis Xavier and Peter Faber were already living with one of their teachers, Maestro Peña. And that was the room, uh, as the providence would have it, that was the room that was assigned to uh, Ignatius of Loyola. At this time, Francis is already 23 years of age. He has completed already the philosophy studies and he was a very good student, uh, very bright. And he had already, before moving on to do theology, theology studies, he has, um, he has already started teaching philosophy as a regent. Uh, regent meant they would uh, repeat the lessons that the professors did in the morning, but that, bring, that brought some income to the students. So uh, Xavier is already recognized as, uh, as a master in, uh, in Paris. Now, going on to the topic of conversion, I'll develop it in, in these uh, brief points. First is uh, conversion to Ignatius, uh, conversion then to Christ, then an ongoing conversion in the life of Xavier. And these two points I will also be touching briefly, approach to conversion in the mission field and with the, the beginning aim of uh, Xavier wanting to convert the whole of India and China and Japan, uh, the perspective changes to wanting to be a, a gate, a door uh, for the future conversion of these, uh, these nations, these continents. Now, first conversion to Ignatius in the sense of, uh, you know, as I already explained the, the background, they come from enemy families and they are together now. And the first biographer of um, Xavier would say this, Xavier was the lumpiest dow uh, he had ever needed, means he was, he was hard to, to get at. So what would be the attitude of Francis Xavier towards Ignatius? It will be obviously cold and distant, knowing that he's coming from a, a family background that is, um, that is in rivalry with his own family. Uh, he did not miss any occasion of despising uh, Ignatius. Besides, he is already uh, three years, uh, he has already finished his philosophy studies. Ignatius uh, also is older. And then uh, they already know that uh, Ignatius has been persecuted by church authorities. His doctrine is under suspicion. He has been um, suspected of being belong to this sect called Alumbrados, who, who uh, and that uh, Ignatius Xavier would have looked at him with certain suspicion. Is, is he a good company to keep with? Because uh, the church authorities, the Inquisition is, is persecuting him. So uh, Francis Xavier on the other hand was very ambitious and he was tall, strong, very handsome, um, and he is also a champion in many of the sports items, especially the high jump and, and long jump. So uh, he is much uh, uh, looked upon by uh, esteem in the University of Paris. So why should he be, you know, um, making friendship with, with Ignatius? So there is this, there is this uh, distancing from, from Ignatius. How would Ignatius look at, how would Ignatius have looked at Francis Xavier? In Francis, we could say that Ignatius saw himself before his conversion. Uh, Ignatius was very, very similar to, to Francis Xavier uh, with regard to his ambitions. Ignatius wanted to be in the court of the King of Castile uh, and he wanted to make his own career and that he received from the family, always wanting to excel always wanting to distinguish himself in the service of the king. So in a way, when Ignatius saw Francis Xavier, he saw himself before his own conversion. But at the same time, he saw in, in Francis Xavier, could say pure fire. Some people have called Francis Xavier 
uh, firebrand. So Ignatius had a very good eye. He recognized the character of, of people and he knew that Francis Xavier was worth the while. So uh, he would go after Francis Xavier. So what was Francis Ignatius' strategy? First, he had to win him over to himself. So he uses this strategy. The, this is the fourth rule of the second week of exercises where he says, uh, you should use the strategy of the, of the evil spirit. Uh, he says, he gets in with, uh, with our door to get out uh, from his own door. This was Ignatius also as, had given this advice to others going to Ireland and all that how we should move. He said, we should use the strategy of the evil one, but evil one uses that strategy for the evil ends, but we should be using it for good ends. So that is the strategy Ignatius uses with Francis Xavier. Knowing that Francis Xavier is very ambitious, he gave him financial help. Now, Francis Xavier needed, needed money. Uh, his family, as I said, because of the disgrace, was not receiving enough income. Francis Xavier also had a servant whom he had to pay. Besides, he had to pay for uh, a certification uh, because he had to prove that he came from a noble uh, family. So to acquire that, he had to spend money also so that he can get the canonship uh, in, in Loyola, so uh, in, in Pamplona. For, for this purpose, Igne Francis Xavier needed money. Now Ignatius would help him with, with this financial support. Then another thing was, um, you know, the, I said Francis Xavier was teaching, but uh, those days um, it was not like people enlisted for a course. They attended classes of the best professors. So Ignatius would, Stand, you can ima imagine Ignatius in the corridors of the University of Paris telling people, Go to Francis Xavier's class, he's a very good, very good teacher. So he would promote them to his class so that Francis Xavier, seeing his class full, would be, would be happy. You see how uh, Ignatius enters uh, the life of Xavier through uh, Xavier's own door, but he had uh, the final purpose of getting him to, to himself. So, and a lot of patience. It, look, it took almost three years for, uh, for Ignatius to strike a friendship with, uh, with, Igna uh, with Francis Xavier. So we could, we could quote this for his, he is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. So, uh, because of the friendship and through this patience, through this strategy, though they came from rival families, they they become they become friends and they become friends for for life. Now this uh, picture that you that you see is uh, uh, summarizes what we have said so far. The uh, Francis Xavier shown. Um, with his legitimate pride and uh, legitimate ambition, he was just pursuing the ambition of his times. And uh, besides that, we should also keep in mind that his conversion, like that of uh, Ignatius himself, is a conversion from an ordinary Christian life because they lived a Christian life. At least they, they practiced the, uh, the outward rituals. Uh, this would be the Ignatian tradition, uh, be it uh, uh, Francis Xavier, be it Nadal later, uh, Borgia, all these people, they lived a good Christian life, but they, they had to make this passage from just uh, practicing a religion to living a religion in a, in a committed manner. And that is what uh, uh, Francis Xavier would do. And he also had a last opportunity. I remember that certificate that he wanted, accrediting him of being a noble man. That did arrive just before he was leaving Paris. He still had a chance, you know, either to follow uh, the group of his companions or to go back to Pamplona and acquire 
that canonship in the in the cathedral which would which would be the gateway to become um, uh, a bishop but he would uh, just before he left uh, he would get that certificate but he would he would leave it behind and go with his companions to to venice here we have two two uh, interesting letters now there is this um, when uh, Ignatius goes back to Loyola for, for health reasons, for recovery. He carried the letters of his companions. He carried the letters of uh, Xavier for, uh, for his brother. Uh, and then there, uh, he says a few things because, you know, uh, Xavier is sending a letter to his, his, his brother with Ignatius, but Xavier's brothers also know that, you know, you're sending an enemy to his house. But Xavier is here giving introduction saying that, no, Ignatius is a good man. He has, he has uh, treated me well. He has helped me uh, financially, etc. And then you see the underlined uh, lines there. It says, Master Ignatius will tell your grace on my behalf. Uh, do me the favor of giving as much credit to him as you would to me in person. So. Um, that is, you know, uh, Francis Xavier is saying that Ignatius uh, represents himself. Reciprocally also, when um, Xavier is going to India, he has left Rome and is on the way to Portugal, but he would be passing through the um, uh, Loyola's family. There he is um, carrying a letter of Ignatius to uh, Loyola's nephew, Beltran, who is now the head of the family, there he is saying, Master Francis will give uh, you full details and will tell you about everything in my name as though I were present in person. So again, here, um, Francis Xavier would be representing or, uh, Ignatius himself. So this is the type of friendship they have struck. It is their alter egos of each other. You know? they, they place themselves, they could very well placed themselves in the position of the other. So you get an idea of the depth of friendship that, uh, that they have come to. So after winning Francis Xavier to oneself, now he is, uh, his next step is to win Francis Xavier over to God from an ordinary mediocre Christian life to make him live a more committed Christian life. So intention of Ignatius is not to win uh, Francis Xavier to oneself. His own conversion consisted in substituting the objective of his life with the greater glory of God. So what happens in the life of Ignatius was uh, that uh, his spirit of wanting to excel, uh, distinguish himself in the service of an earthly king and a lady of his dreams. Now those objectives are substituted by the uh, by giving glory to God alone. Uh, so Francis Xavier, his nature, as uh, because grace builds upon the nature and grace perfects nature. Um, Francis Xavier, uh, Ignatius has, as a person, has has not changed, but his objectives in life have changed. So now he wants to do the same with the uh, with francis xavier he wants francis xavier to be ambitious but he wants the object of his ambition be god alone and the glory of god and that is what uh, ignatius does with francis xavier to engage francis with the same goal uh, was ignatius's next step he wanted francis xavier also to aspire to serve god alone so some of the questions um, and lessons that uh, that we can learn here, you know, uh, from from this story, uh, that reconciliation is possible uh, even between these families that were that were rival, and they could they could become they could become friends. Another lesson that also we can we can learn very very relevant for us is people from different um, ethnic, cultural, language backgrounds can come together and can, can live together. Uh, and then uh, GC 36, 
for the Jesuits has put reconciliation uh, as an important uh, ministry, uh, a part of a um, part of a mission, recon participating in the reconciliatory mission of Christ, uh, and that. I think begins at home, as we see in the case of uh, Francis Xavier and Ignatius. So a reconciliation, our mission should begin uh, from our own from our own communities. And those of us who those of you who are also involved in uh, in vocation promotion, uh, there is also a lesson there that vocation promotion is a very very patient task. You know? If need be, we first need to strike a friendship with the with the people um, we might see as uh, prospective religious so uh, accompanying them with with a lot of patience first making them friends so that we can then make them friends of uh, friends of jesus okay moving on then uh, in uh, 1534 is the uh, in august before ignatius leaves for his um, for Loyola for recovery, they make their uh, they make their vows, the the Montmartre vows of uh, of chastity and and poverty and a promise to go to the to the Holy Land, and then Ignace Francis Xavier, uh, so he makes his vows, uh, this commitment before he makes his exercises. So he has he has made his uh, made up his mind, but uh, making his exercises. Um, come as a confirmation of the decision he has taken. So uh, it's popularly said that uh, Francis Ignatius converted Francis Xavier with these words, what does it profit a man? Might have used these words, but these words alone didn't do the magic. As we saw, it, it took a very, very patient labor for Ignatius to win over Francis. So uh, this is what Schurhammer writes in his, in his book about um, Francis Xavier's own experience of making the exercises. So he was another man, though he was the same cheerful and lovable companion as before, a holy fire illuminated his, his countenance. So um, now he has made this transition, uh, his object, of devotion now, his his aim in life would be only to give glory to, to God. Uh, this, this topic's ongoing conversion, approach to conversions in the mission field and wanting to convert others you know, to opening the door. Uh, I have treated that in the in the article, brief article in the in the yearbook of the of the society this year. So once he goes to India, the, his um, uh, the ongoing conversion, conversion being a being a very complex process, it has it has different different levels uh, of uh, of conversion, uh, and we know that it was it was not easy for Francis Xavier uh, initially in the mission field. He thought uh, like everybody else in his time, baptism was required uh, to be part of the church was required to be to be saved he goes with that mentality and he wants to baptize as many people as as possible and then from from india he's is moving on to malacca and then to japan and then to china uh, the experience in japan would, would teach him many lessons he realizes that you know conversion is is um, not just a matter of uh, of baptizing or of just a matter of learning catechism it also is a matter of engaging with the other engaging with the religion and the background of the other so uh, this is where Igne Xavier is going through his own his own conversion that is his ongoing conversion his idea of converting other to Christ is is maturing and then he thought also that he wanted to convert the the whole of india he thought by converting the kings that was his idea and when he goes to japan he realizes that you know it is not uh, it is not as he as he thought then he also knew that the japanese 
were following Chinese philosophy and they were looking up to China for their own, for their own religions. Uh, and, and then he realizes that uh, before you wanted to convert all these people, but towards the end of his life, in his later letters, he says, uh, he, that language of wanting to convert others is, uh, uh, is not there, but he says he wants to be a medium. He wants to open the door. He wants to open the uh, door of Christ uh, to others. To, to Japanese, to, to Chinese. So now his pretense of wanting to convert these, uh, these continents, these great nations has, uh, has disappeared. So uh, this is in, in brief, his, his ongoing conversion. Now we move on to the next topic of, uh, of, of friendship. Um, the friends in the Lord uh, there after uh, in uh, the time they spent in the Santa Barbara, three people, uh, Ignatius, uh, Xavier, and Peter Faber, one room, one table, one purse, uh, especially one, one purpose. The three uh, shared the same room. Uh, Peter will write about, uh, Peter Faber writes this in, um, in his uh, spiritual journal. He says, we came to possess same desires and allowed the same thing. So he's writing that in plural. So he, uh, Xavier also is part of that, uh, sharing the same ideal, having a, having a same dream. Ignatius and Francis, the, according to James Martin, I think the one who gave the webinar uh, last month, uh, he writes in his book that it's one of the best or the best known spiritual spiritual friendship. That said, we should also keep in mind that uh, in 1537, when Ignatius was traveling from Venice to Rome, his travel companions were Diego Linus and Peter Faber. Uh, he didn't uh, he didn't pick uh, Xavier. Uh, that was also the style of uh, Ignatius. Ignatius. Um, when they, they divided themselves, he mixed them, uh, mixed their nationalities and ethnic groups. He didn't put people of same nationality together. He has picked um, uh, French and a Spanish man to be with himself. Later in the same year, while, while journeying to Rome also, um, there is his companions of, of Ignatius. He has not picked Francis Xavier. Francis Xavier's companions were Bobadilla and uh, Simon Rodriguez. He also worked in Bologna. Bologna was the place, for example, where uh, Xavier's own, own father had done, done his doctorate. So uh, Xavier would have been happy to be in Bologna where his own father had studied. Uh, we also know that Francis Xavier was the first secretary of the society and secretary of, uh, of Xavier. So we also keep these um, uh, details in mind when we say that um, their friendship was the best known spiritual friendships. Why spiritual? You know, uh, why, why we say that this friendship was a spiritual friendship? Uh, early in 1539, uh, before the dispersion of this first companions to different parts of the world, uh, Pope was in a hurry to send these people, the, the scholars from Paris. The king of Portugal, John III, wanted uh, the men of the society uh, for his own lands. So before that, they had to meet the, the first companions and they had to decide if they wanted to remain as a group. Uh, that was very easy to decide. They said they want to remain as a group. Uh, and if so, how to remain, uh, how to retain their union? Should we or not form a union? How to remain in union while the Pope is sending us on mission? So as a group, uh, the earlier model of, um, of religious life was community staying together. The model was of stability. Now these people uh, are a group uh, which are mobile by nature, uh, mobility against uh, uh, stability. 
uh, there comes this tension uh, a physical proximity and uh, and dispersion if they disperse uh, how would the the union of the group retain so that is where um, this author Moran O'Leary he writes what they were really sacrificing was one particular experience and expression of companionship namely that of physical presence our closeness to one another this was not the same as abandoning their bond of union but it left them with a challenge as to how to keep and even deepen that bond in other ways than through phys physical proximity perhaps now we are in the in the atmosphere of uh, of covid we know how important is is physical proximity uh, but now uh, we also have uh, the fact that i can be speaking to you all from from rome shows that uh, virtual world has brought us together uh, but i think we can't make the mistake of equating uh, virtual closeness with spiritual closeness spiritual closeness goes goes deeper it uh, virtual reality cannot uh, substitute the spiritual reality spiritual reality is uh, feeling one in the spirit feeling one in the lord so i think it is as much a challenge today for us as it was for ignatius and francis xavier to keep alive that uh, spiritual closeness uh, being one in the in the spirit so what i have said so far now um, these two pictures that i place before you um, there is this uh, xavier uh, who was ambitious uh, for him sky was the limit he he wanted um, to be a bishop and bring back the glory of his castle and then now uh, humbly he is placing himself before before ignatius uh, taking his blessing uh, before leaving for leaving for india this painting you have in the church of ignatius in rome um, the departure and on a very very short notice on one day's notice uh, Francis Xavier said, I am here at your disposal and send me. So uh, there is this, uh, there's this long journey between the first picture and the, and the second picture. Now we look at some of the snippets from the letters of, uh, of Francis Xavier, where we come to have an idea of uh, the depth of his, his friendship with, with Ignatius. Uh, many of the openings of the letter, the way he addressed uh, Ignatius. Uh, in the first document where he, is, uh, he was not there when the society was officially approved, so he signs his own vote for the next general. In that he, he writes, our old and true father. In other letters, the, he addresses Ignatius as father in uh, Christi Vicheribus, that is, in the bowels of Christ, so to say, means in the, in the heart of Christ, a father in Christ, or uh, in other places, father of my soul, my most revered uh, father, my dearest father, my only father, and my, my true father. Now, what this, uh, this true father could signify, uh, it is, I, I don't think it is just a rhetoric tool. It is not just a way of expressing. I think Francis Xavier truly felt that Ignatius was his true father in the sense, Ignatius was at least 15 years older than, than Francis Xavier. Uh, Xavier had lo lost his dad, the father, when uh, he was just nine years old. And, uh, and his father was mostly absent. He was in Pamplona in the, in the service of the, of the court uh, of the Duke there. So um, Francis's own father was, um, was a distant figure. And from what we saw, uh, the, uh, the assistance Ignatius gave Francis Xavier in, in Paris, in a way he, he fulfilled the role of a father uh, in the life of uh, uh, Francis Xavier. So when he calls Ignatius my true father, he's really feeling feeling that, and it is not just a way of, uh, and not just a pious way of uh, addressing. He's really feeling that 
you know, Ignatius has fulfilled not only the fathership, fatherhood of uh, spiritual fatherhood, but also of uh, of real fatherhood of what a father would do for uh, his his son. The way he closes the letter, so uh, two times before before signing, he says, your least son uh, and least and most useless son or your dearest brother in Christ, sometimes as brother also, brothers in Christ, and two other times as your least son in the father's exile. It, it sounds very good in Spanish. So menor hijo in this tierra mayor. So these are some of the ways in which he, he closes the letter. So it gives us an idea of, um, uh, of the esteem in which he held Ignatius. The, the other letters that I'm, I'm quoting here, uh, they have, um, um, they give us an idea of uh, uh, Xavier's love for his companions, then his own devotion to Ignatius and his love for the society. Uh, we get a good idea of these things in the letters that I have chosen here. So he says um, he does not want to forget his companions. That is where he writes, I have cut your names from the letters which you have written to me with your own hands so that I may constantly carry them with me together with a vow of profession which I made <clears throat> because of the consolations which I received from them. So that is how we know that he had those signatures cut out and placed in a casket, which he always wore around his, uh, his neck. Uh, then we also have, uh, when, he, when he speaks about his love for the, for the society, he uses the words of a Psalmist. He says, uh, if I should ever forget the society of the name of Jesus, may my right hand be forgotten. So, and then, we have another thing, his gratitude. Uh, he says, sin of ingratitude. Uh, according to Ignatius, we know uh, that in a letter he wrote to Simon Rodriguez, he says, the sin of uh, the ingratitude is, is the gravest of sins. That is not to recognize the source of all the good that we receive is, is the biggest ingratitude. And uh, for, uh, for Francis Xavier also, uh, not being grateful is the biggest sin. So, and if he is separated from the society, is far away, is because it is for out of love for for Christ. Again, this is a dimension of uh, of spiritual friendship. Uh, then we have another beautiful text written in the context of uh, Francis Xavier having to. Uh, dismiss people from the society, which was a very, very hard task. Uh, but he also adds this very beautiful expression, you know, society of Jesus means to say a society of love and conformity of minds and not a society of survived fear. So if somebody has to remain in the society, it should be out of love for Christ and not out of, uh, out of fear. So, uh, that would be his criteria when he would dismiss people from the, from the society. And the way he wrote uh, his devotion to Ignatius, when he wrote to Ignatius, you know, he, he fell to his ground, fell to the ground, he fell upon his knees to write the letters to, to Ignatius. This representation that you have there is quite, uh, uh, what you call, uh, uh, um, true to what uh, the things would have been because he's showing his writing on the seashore uh, with, the, with the ships there. He usually wrote in a hurry when the ships were about to embark. And uh, that's the reason why the artist has chosen this representation of uh, Xavier writing the letters uh, on, the, on the seashore with the, with the ships about to set sail. And then um, you have this another beautiful piece from the letters of uh, Francis Xavier, uh, showing his love, his devotion to, to Ignatius. When he has come, is coming back from Malacca, he receives this, this letter uh, in which he reads uh, these lines, entirely yours, with my, being, uh, with my being able to forget you at any time, Ignatius, without my being able to forget you at any time. 
so reading this, he says, uh, and uh, just as I then read them with tears, so I'm now writing these with, with tears. So, and we know what significance tears have in Ignatian spirituality. You know, they're a sign of uh, spiritual consolation. And uh, uh, Ignatius, as Xavier is writing, uh, feeling this uh, sign of consolation, consolation from God, even as he's writing these letters to Francis, uh, to Ignatius in, in Rome. So then uh, another piece, he says, your holy charity has written to me that you have a great desire to see me before you leave this life. God our Lord knows what an impression these words of great love made upon my soul and how many tears they have cost me whenever I recall them. And it seems to me that I shall have this con consolation since nothing is impossible to holy obedience. So he is, still has that desire of, uh, of seeing uh, Ignatius. <clears throat> so now we come to authentic friendship. Does not mean that what I have said so far, this friendship before was not uh, authentic friendship. Uh, what I mean would be clear as, as we go ahead. Now, um, Ign uh, Xavier is also writing about his plans to go to, go to China. He writes on the 24th of uh, January, 1552, uh, Francis uh, uh, returns unexpectedly, unexpectedly to Cochin from Japan. Uh, the stay of ja Ignace Xavier in, in Japan comes to an abrupt end. He goes to this port called Bungo in, in, in Japan and uh, uh, a ship has arrived and has not brought any news from India or elsewhere. So probably that is the reason, seeing no news, he does not see no news as a good news and decides to return to, to India. And then on the, on the 29th of Jan, he writes to Ignatius, revealing his, his plans to go to, to China. So in Japan, he has come to know that the Japanese esteem the Chinese and they have borrowed their religion and philosophy from China. So he realizes that if China becomes uh, Christian, Japan would follow suit. So he writes this, if there should be no obstacles here in India to prevent me from leaving this year, I hope to go to China for the great service of our Lord, which can be rendered both in China and Japan. For if the Japanese learn that the Chinese have accepted the law of God, they will more quickly lose their faith in their sects. So they would accept Christianity. So meanwhile, what is happening here? The, meanwhile, there are there are tensions that are that are rising. Um, the king of uh, uh, King John the Third, who is the patron, who has been sending all these missionaries, he is upset when he comes to know that uh, Xavier is gone to Japan because Japan is not the territory of the king. He wanted. Uh, uh, Xavier to work in, uh, in India and in Malacca, where uh, there is this, this Portuguese presence. So he is upset and he has complained to, to Ignatius. Also, letters from other Jesuits are reaching, um, reaching Rome. They're saying Francis Xavier, who is the provincial, he's, he's been appointed the provincial, and he's never there in, in India. No? Master Francis is never there. So he is either in uh, uh, Malacca, or he is in he is in Japan now. He's planning to go to China. So um, these these letters, and then there is infight among the Jesuits within within India. And Xavier is not there as a superior to resolve those those conflicts. Now, in this context, uh, there is this what we call the recall letter. Xavier is Ignatius is writing to to Xavier. Ignatius writes on 27th of June, 1553, well, when he receives that letter of um, uh, Xavier um, speaking about his plans to go to, to China. And to that letter, Ignatius is responding. Of course, by this time, uh, Xavier is already dead. Uh, the fact, uh, this fact, Ignatius didn't know. But he writes to, to Xavier. He rejoices uh, at what has been achieved in Japan. And then also 
he rejoices at learning that the gate is open to the gospel in China. After this introduction, uh, Ignatius also does not mince words and writes this. You know, it seems to me, however, that it would have been proper for you to have sent Master Gasper or others to China. And even if you yourself will have gone to China, uh, I shall, um, where you said that you intended to go if uh, you were not prevented from doing so by affairs in India, I shall regard it as being well done, persuading myself that it is the eternal wisdom which is guiding you. Still, from what can be understood from here, I am of the opinion that God our Lord would have been better served by your person if you had remained in India and sent others there, instructing them to do what you yourself would have done. For in this way, you would have been doing in many places what you did through your own person in one. So you see, there is, um, on the one hand, uh, Ignatius knows that Xavier is being guided by eternal wisdom, but he is also giving his own view, saying that uh, he could serve the mission better by remaining in, in India. And I further say that considering the greatest service of God our Lord and the assistant of souls in those regions and how much their welfare depends upon Portugal, I have decided to order you in virtue of holy obedience to take among the many roads, the one leading to Portugal with the first opportunity that you have for, the good, uh, for a good voyage. And I'm consequently ordering you to do this in the name of Jesus Christ, even though you should be ready to return soon to India. Now, um, why would Ignatius order uh, under holy obedience? Uh, wasn't it sufficient to call him back? This is something that is a little puzzling. Uh, another scholar was saying that uh, by ordering under holy obedience, the one, who's, one who obeys has a greater merit, but Ignatius always does not use this language, but he is, he is saying that that is a little at, puzzling, at least, to, at least to me. Then he gives reasons, Ignatius gives some of the reasons, there are four reasons given to report to the king what is happening in India. So he wanted first-hand information, which is fair enough. Igne Xavier was also going as a nuncio to, to India. So as a, a apostolic nuncio, it is good for him to come back to Rome and report uh, what, is, uh, what is happening. Uh, he could also recruit because he's been writing uh, constantly to send more men. So he's saying by coming and speaking about the mission in India, he could recruit men to go to India and to give advice on Brazil and Ethiopia. So um, they are um, they're failing in Ethiopia. So Xavier's advice on these matters would help people in, in Portugal. Uh, Xavier also, Ignatius is also saying that um, um, in from, from Portugal also, you know, by being absent in India, from being absent in India, if he could govern. So being absent in, from India for some time, staying in Portugal also, he could, uh, he could govern. So uh, in, these are the reasons Ignatius is uh, giving. And at the end of this letter, Ignatius writes, uh, signs this way in his own hand, entirely yours in the Lord, signed uh, Ign uh, Ignacio. And there is another adjointer also to this letter uh, by Polanco. After this, Ignatius has sent this letter. Polanco is writing this. In addition to what, you have, uh, what our father is writing in his letters, um, he has some other reasons which have motivated him no less than those which have been already written. So we don't know what these uh, reasons are, but they are again a bit, uh, bit puzzling. So uh, how do we interpret this? Why do I, why do I call this uh, uh, this way of going about by Ignatius as, um, uh, as authentic friendship? Uh, you see, um, though Xavier was his best friend, when, when it came to governance, when it came to mission, 
it uh, friendship didn't come in the way of sending Xavier to Xavier to India. Now, by the same token, that same friendship does not come in the way of calling him back to back to Rome when it is uh, when it is needed. Mission takes priority. Uh, there are these complaints, and uh, uh, Ignatius wants to wants to discuss them. Uh, even though Xavier is uh, is his close friend, so and he is he is very very clear. Uh, for me, the the criteria for um, uh, for uh, for evaluating this uh, a tool to interpret would be number twenty two of the exercises, where um, uh, you all are familiar with that. Uh, Ignatius is giving a good interpretation to the intentions of uh, of Xavier. But at the same time, he wants to understand what exactly is, uh, is happening. So he does not uh, make harsh judgment on Xavier. He calls him back. He says, if there are doubts, he says, we should clear them. So he has questions. And he thinks that uh, instead of coming to conclusions, it is better to ask Xavier himself. So this would be an uh, interpretative key. So now um, come to come to conclusion. So we began with with conversion that was mediated by by friendship, uh, and also we saw how the conversion to God breaks down existential peripheries. Uh, it breaks down prejudices, and then um, it also promotes fosters new and deep and lasting friendships with the with one's own community members. So there. The web, the um, network of friendships only becomes wider. Uh, it also makes one friendship with the with the poor. Ignatius Xavier would um, Ignatius would write in one of his letters that friendship with the poor makes us friends of God. And then uh, finally, a call to conversion to to the truth. You know, beyond our own personal certainties and and convictions. Um, we have today, uh, people are not really bothered about the truth, but uh, it's enough that they're, they're con uh, convinced about their own certainties. Uh, we jokingly say, what's up university? So you are convinced about a few things. You are not concerned if it is true or not, but it is your conviction. Uh, so we could say that my truth, your truth, let us not contradistinguish them, but let us let us learn, um, look for truth together because um, the truth of two can teach us, teach us more. Ignatius had his truth, Francis Xavier had and his truth. Francis Xavier wanted to go to China, he was convinced. Ignatius has a different perspective. So um, he's calling him back. Um, and this is a sign of authentic friendship that it should, it should go, go deeper, uh, does not matter if the other is other is your friend and this is also for uh, superiors today uh, how do how do superiors take uh, decisions when it when it comes to friends what are the criteria they they have here is something that ignatius is uh, is teaching us um, yesterday was colvin um, uh, bach's anniversary death anniversary and I just received this today, so I, I just put that there. I think it's a good way to, way to conclude. So thank you so much for your, your patient listening. Father Rolfi. Yes. Thank, thank you so much for uh, beautifully presenting uh, the topic, conversion and uh, spiritual friendship of St. Ignatius and uh, St. Francis Xavier. Uh, you in your presentation, uh, very comprehensive it was. We, you gave a lot of insights, and especially about his conversion, which was a, a sort of ongoing process. Till his death, he was undergoing that kind of conversion, which actually began in Paris when he met uh, St. Ignatius. And especially I like the two insights you gave about uh, the conversion and about uh, Francis Xavier and St. Ignatius that uh, aspect of reconciliation. They were from two different rival groups, yet when the grace of Jesus brought them together, they were in a position to forget their past, enmity, rivalry, reconcile with each other, 
and live together in friendship. He also spoke about another point that is uh, um, they belong to two different ethnic groups, yet uh, they were uh, like you no know, ready to live under the same roof. Especially in today's context, where there is a lot of ethnocentric uh, attitude, not only among the religious, even among the people outside. Uh, Saint Francis Xavier and Saint Ignatius, they stand as towering examples to how how to uh, like you no know, live as reconciled people and how to reconcile with the different rivalry groups. Uh, you also spoke beautifully about the conversion. Uh, not so much personal conversion, which you have already spoken, but uh, when he came to India, St. Francis Xavier, we all know that he was interested only in number. He was baptizing thousands of people so that they could become Christians. But uh, you, in your presentation, beautifully said that uh, he was engaging the person, taking into consideration their ethnic background, cultural background, and so many other aspects belonging to their culture, language, and other things. So thank you so much for uh, that presentation. Now I request the group, if anybody has any questions for clarification, or if you want to contribute any insights into the presentation made by Father Rolfi Pinto, you are most welcome. I request you to make use of the uh, raised hand icon, which is there in your system or you can text a message in the form of question, and I will be giving opportunities to each one of you to uh, ask the presenter, speaker, Father Rolfi Pinto, any uh, information you like to seek from him. Yeah. I see one question here in the, in the chat box. Could I attend to that? Uh, yeah, sure, Anthony? sure, Father Rolfi. He says, yeah. Father, could you please differentiate between Marges and uh, perfectionism okay uh, i think it's a very important uh, important question much is simply put i would say without going into too many details much is simply means to love more it comes from um, the spiritual exercises the grace of the second week to know him more to love him more to follow him more so uh, if uh, perfectionism or usually majis is uh, mm, put against um, uh, excellence, you know, we use this word uh, excellence quite a lot. And sometimes we equate margins with, uh, with excellence. Uh, I think we have to be uh, really careful here. Sometimes and, uh, excellence means we want to be uh, successful, we, we want to be, we want to be perfect. But if you understand margins as, as loving more, uh, there, are, there are no limits. No, it is always um, a healthy restlessness within of uh, wanting to love more. Uh, it's, it's like a mother who puts no, no limits, no limits on loving. So for me, that is, that is the key to understand Marjis. Uh, and that, uh, that come, Marjis comes from the word mass. Ignatius himself never used the word Marjis. Mass is to, is more. This is, it's a healthy restlessness. Uh, in if you if you want to say so, excelling in loving, they say the love is the only virtue you don't overdo. Uh, other virtues maybe you can you can overdo. So uh, loving uh, Marjis really means loving more. Uh, it and it comes from a very personal knowledge of Christ. So uh, you have to that grace of the second week to know Him more, to love Him more, and to and to follow Him more. That I would say about uh, about Marjis. Uh, for Rolfi, yes. Uh, see, uh, could you uh, throw some more light on uh, Saint Francis Xavier's conversion? In the sense, he was baptizing so many people here in India, and you gave a nice insight already. Uh, there is an accusation against him that uh, he was converting for the sake of number, but in your presentation, you gave a different version of the same. Could you throw some more light on yeah. that? No, uh, initially he was certainly concerned um, about about the numbers because, uh, um, yeah, that was the theology of the time. Unless you were baptized, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be saved. So um, he held that view 
uh, and I am of the opinion that there is ongoing conversion and taking place. Uh, and then uh, probably when he was in, in India and in Malacca and these places, he still held that, that opinion until he reached Japan, where he has, he has a, he, there are people challenging him in, in Japan. And uh, his view of India also was very, very partial. He knew only a small part of, uh, part of India. That's very, very unfortunate. He, uh, uh, he did not really know the, the soul of India. But whereas Japan, he, he, he engaged quite a lot with the, with the bonzos and, and the, with the masters there. And there he realizes what you were saying there. Uh, you can't engage with the people unless you um, first made a friendship with them, try to understand the, understand the culture. So um, there is where I feel that what I call uh, in the Lonergan's uh, Lonergan terminology, an intellectual conversion. So intellectual conversion is uh, uh, to, to put simply, reality is not just what you, what you see with your eyes. Uh, reality is much more. Uh, where you need to get a deeper insight into the web of uh, interconnectedness. Uh, I think this, this conversion Ignatius uh, Francis Xavier goes through uh, when he goes to Japan. So um, th there is where he says, before he says, you, you send anyone to India, we just want to baptize. But when he comes back from Japan, he says, no, we want uh, learned people uh, who he says, people who are no good in Europe are no good here either. So that is the type of language he is, he is changing. There is, I see a change taking place. So uh, again, when we also evaluate people, we cannot, uh, what we call, extract part of their life or see one, one segment of their life and uh, make judgments. I think we have to, we have to see the, the whole stretch and we get a better idea, a holistic picture. Otherwise, we are only taking fragments and we come to come to judgment. So when you look at the entire span of Xavier's life, I think we, we get a better idea and we can be a little more um, open and reasonable when we come to judgments. Thank you. Uh, in the chat box, there is a question. Yes. Yeah. Could you read it for me, uh, Prashant? Yeah. Uh, conversion at different levels can be a tool for vocation promotion, but the patience is the key. How can we use this tool in our context when vocations are on the decline? <laughs> I think the, the answer is there in the question itself, uh, in the sense that uh, uh, it, is not, it is not easy to, to, first of all, to understand the language of the, of the youth today. When I say language, it is not just the spoken language, uh, their whole cultural, cultural world. What Ignatius did was he understood the cultural world of, of Xavier, who was half his, almost half his age at, uh, at that time. And uh, most people with whom we deal today, the youth, um, to enter into that mentality, that, that is a challenge. So like uh, before it was, it was sports and games, we played uh, football or cricket with them. Today, I think uh, they are uh, playing outdoor games is very less, but they are mostly in their virtual world. And it is so difficult to understand their language, but to enter into their world is to be familiar with this uh, modern gadgets and tools of, uh, of communication. I think uh, that would be one of the keys of spending time with them in those entering to, through their door, if they like Facebook or they like Instagram, maybe it is through that we have to enter. It is, but not only to make them our friends, but eventually make them friends of the Lord, whether they join or not, but it is showing because uh, that is our first apostolic preference, you know, showing the way to God through spiritual exercises. And spiritual exercises is a tool that can be, that is supposed to be very flexible. And uh, so I would, I would say that 
use the strategy of, of Ignatius of entering to, through their door to get out uh, from our own. Uh, Rolfi, there is another question. Uh, it is there in the chat box. What would St. Ignatius' and uh, Francis Xavier's relationship mean to younger Jesuits of this era? Well, I think uh, that is the whole topic of the whole, uh, whole, whole webinar of, uh, of spiritual friendship. As I said, today, uh, even uh, we are connected very well. Uh, we have this, um, uh, what you call, revolution of, of communication. Uh, but what I would ask is uh, myself also, what is the quality of, of friendships that we have? Just because we are communicating uh, virtually, does that mean that uh, there is that there is that depth? Can we really say that we are friends in the Lord? And do we also do uh, one is uh, caring for the others? But sometimes when we say caring for others, uh, it is like you know I say you scratch my back, I scratch your back, and it remains at that because in the social media it is only the likes. But uh, I think from the letter of Francis Xavier, Ignatius to Francis Xavier, he says that Ignatius didn't hesitate when, uh, when he had to you know, pull up a little bit, Xavier, saying, why are you going around you? You stay in. Uh, uh, that is what we call care fronting. No? When you have difficulties, when you have doubts, uh, do we have the, the courage or we say audacity also? to engage into dialogue, clarify things. I'm not saying confronting, we use the word care fronting, but um, I think in that letter, we see something of that was happening. We don't know how things would have been if um, Xavier was, Xavier really received the letter and then they went to Rome. But uh, from that letter, we get an idea of, uh, of how Ignatius didn't hesitate, you know, even to pull up, Pull up may not be the right word, but invite uh, Xavier into a dialogue where you can really sort out things. And that is where you can, you can go into depth. And today we are using the term spiritual conversation. I think this is all part of spiritual conversation. So what we could ask is, what is the quality of our relationships? It is, is it just on the superficial level? We only say what the other wants to hear or are we also willing to uh, willing to challenge? It is to it is to risk. There is there are risks involved, but are we are we willing to go below the uh, um, below the surface? Uh, go go deeper. I I think that is a lesson we can we can learn from their um, communication. Uh, Rolfi, there are many questions in the chat box. Uh, would you like to take them uh, together or one by one? Uh, okay. I think uh, the next question would be, what is the difference between Ignatius and Francis Xavier regarding promoting local locations? Anyway, Maybe that, briefly you can uh, touch upon all these things. Yeah, now this is a very, very complex and hard questions to answer, uh, promoting. Now, um, I was just following the last month's Jeevan, uh, uh, the Spaniards coming to India. And there, there I was looking at um, uh, the last century. We are not talking about four centuries ago. Uh, I was uh, in a way surprised and shocked to see uh, the, the German Jesuits who were before the Spaniards in, uh, in Maharashtra and Gujarat. Uh, the, the Germans didn't, when they left, they had not promoted the local clergy. The, the Germans had not admitted the Indians to the Indians to the society. So, uh, if you're talking about just a century ago or less than a century ago, if we had uh, these uh, these attitudes, I think this is a question. It is not so much a question about the about the past. I would say it's a question about the present. When we we talk about exclusions, you know. It's easy for us to say that, you know, Xavier excluded Indians or the others excluded Indians. But I think there are other forms of uh, exclusions um, that we constantly do. It may not be, it may not be now excluding uh, uh, Indians from joining the society, but I think there are, 
many other forms of uh, exclusions that are that are going on so i would say it is not so much a question about uh, about the past it is more a question of of the present uh, and one one question is about promoting vocations but there are uh, other issues um, when when it comes to equality of men and women when it promoting uh, the rights of women where are we you know, just to give an just to give an example so i think that question is very much a question about the about the present it it's an invitation for us to reflect on on, on the type of exclusions that we ourselves do today yeah uh, there is a, the next question ignatius relations with his first companions was always deep and personal has any study been done on ignatius relations with peter faber maybe it is out of the topic but you can yeah. just uh, yeah yeah no i have not not come across one uh, study like that there are in the in the jubilee year there were a number of uh, uh, that is 2006 uh um, there are a number of right now i can't recall the publications but uh about the friendship between the three uh, there were uh, there were a number of uh, um uh, what you call publications if this person who is interested writes to me i can i can suggest with some some bibliography okay okay thank you uh, the next one uh, for the prashant is it okay we can go yeah, ahead yeah. yeah we will take last two the last two we shall yeah, take yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, uh rolf in the next question is what is the companionship of st ignatius and francis xavier teaching us or challenging us to bring the scholastics especially nearer not only virtually but spiritually to is there anything newer methods we can imbibe from the life of these great saints our elder brothers okay now one thing i uh, didn't mention also was Uh, there is a recent uh, biography of uh, uh, ignatius by pedro miguel lamet uh, pedro miguel lamet is a very good biographer he wrote a life of uh, Fran- of pedro arupe by far the best and now he has come with a historical novel of um, uh, ignatius there he says uh, in the in the process of conversion uh, when uh, i said ignatius would have seen himself in the young xavier he would have narrated his own life story to to igne uh, to xavier you know to to get him because uh, by narrating one son one son life story would have been um, a medium for him to win xavier to to himself today we call it uh, as i said spiritual spiritual conversation so um and there i am sure the one of the one of the most important things in spiritual conversation is the dimension of listening uh i am sure xavier uh, ignatius had this habit you know he listened first in the autobiography also he says when he first of all he got himself invited for meals but he wouldn't speak much during the meals and he answered briefly at the end of the meals now this non judgmental listening is a, a very important part of uh, uh, of spiritual conversation so um how how would how did ignatius enter Uh, into a deep relationship into the depths i think he by spending a lot of time in in listening and um, to listen also to create the the right atmosphere so uh, uh, i think through um, through this um, means of spending patient time to in order to understand the other it's indispensable to list to is to listen those of you who do spiritual accompaniment here no how important is is this dimension of of listening and then this would open um, open doors for for greater depths so even among the jesuit companions um, we should be encouraging more and more this dimension of faith sharing uh, that is one way of calling uh, another way of uh, another term for spiritual spiritual conversation so um, that i think would would help us to come closer as 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 jesuits telling uh, telling our stories to to each other but uh, telling our stories in such a way that you know 
uh, we grow deeper in, in Christ, not so much to promote, uh, not so much to promote oneself. You know, uh, so spending time, spending time, simply put. Uh, due to constraint of time, we will not be taking up many other questions. One last question, that is, what kind of conversion the society requires today in the light of St. Francis Xavier's conversion? Yeah. No, uh, that, that I would say the conscience search, uh, never, being, never being satisfied. Uh, uh, this healthy un unrestlessness, I said. Uh, Xavier was a different man, the man who left Europe and came to India, and the man who died on the, on the shores of, uh, on that island overlooking China was, was a different Xavier. So uh, he was very much ready to learn from, from life. He was first of all not afraid of facing challenges, uh, but the other thing was his, his readiness uh, to adopt himself, his uh, readiness to learn, uh, this healthy restlessness, um, uh, they have called him also, um, uh, uh, what do you call, impatient, uh, I, don't, I don't get the term right now, but he was this uh, uh, sort of impatient uh, wrestler, he always, uh, he always wanted to, um, you know, discover more, uh, and learn more from the, uh, and then what uh, he learned from life and it kept on uh, changing him. He was, or he let himself be changed by the, uh, it did not change his convictions, but it changed the way he looked at uh, reality. So I would call this re readiness to learn, uh, willingness to learn always in life and uh, not be afraid of facing facing challenges so let's call it the healthy rest restlessness dear friends we come to the end of this webinar i take this opportunity to thank first of all father ralphi pinto who was the resource person of today's uh, webinar i'm sure all of us have enjoyed his talk, which was very much inspirational, and at the same time, which has given us new insights, in the, uh, particularly with regard to conversion, with regard to our friendships, and finally, inviting us to authentic friendship. Thanks to each one uh, for being part of this webinar.